Hi everyone, my name is Matt Salganik and in this lecture, this is part one of my lectures on ethics. So this covers the first half of material in chapter six of Bit by Bit. So I wanna start with a claim, which is that computational social scientists should care about research ethics. This seems like uh, kind of a silly claim. Of course we should care about research ethics, but I wanna argue that it's particularly important for computational social scientists. Um, there are first, there are fear-based reasons. So first of all, none of us want to be in a position where we do something unethical. Um, and in the time that I've seen, of the research I've seen in computational social science, it seems like many computational social scientists are much closer to ethical gray areas than than they often realize. And so it's important for us to just, one, be afraid of ourselves making a mistake. And then also for the field, like as a whole, our field does not want to get tarnished by people who are doing things that are ethically un unsound. Um, and these fear-based reasons, we've heard about these more maybe in the debates around people calling out certain studies as being unethical. I also think there are really important hope-based reasons to focus and care about research ethics. And by this, what I mean is, I think there's a lot of ethically sound, important and interesting research that could happen, but is not currently happening because of all the ambiguity and concerns about research ethics. So to the extent that we as a community can come up with norms and standards and values that we all share, I think that will actually increase our chances of doing important and interesting research. And lastly, I think basically we have no choice. As I said earlier, I think all computational social scientists are much closer to ethical gray areas than they realize. And um, so if you're working in this area, you have to pay attention to research ethics. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to uh, help you design ethically thoughtful research and then explain your decisions to others. And I think this part about explaining your decisions to others is especially important and one that doesn't get discussed as much. So let me elaborate on that a little bit. So as researchers, we often have to solve really hard problems. And then we explain how we solve those problems to other people so that as a community, we can learn and get better and better at solving problems. So with ethics though, often we don't wanna talk about how we solve those problems. We don't share our thinking. And so what that means is it's harder for us as a community to grow and improve our ethical practice. And so I think it's particularly important that not only are you able to think ethically for yourself, but you're able to explain your reasoning to other people. And if we get in the habit of talking about what we're doing, then I think we'll all be able to reason better and more thoughtfully and have the kind of debate that we have in other areas that helps us move forward as a field. So broadly speaking, I think there are kind of two main approaches to research ethics and computational social science. Um, the first is a rules-based approach, and this is more common among people that have training as a social scientist. So this rules-based approach is generally focused on following what the IRB tells you to do. The IRB is the Institutional Review Board. These are bodies inside of US universities that enforce a set of rules that come from the US federal government about uh, ethical research practice. And so for social scientists, there's often a strong focus on what the IRB allows and what those rules allow. Among data scientists, there's much less exposure to IRBs. Uh, and so there in data science, I often see what I would call more of an ad hoc approach. It's not that people don't think about ethics, but they often are thinking about it on their own in the absence of some uh, well-developed framework and in the absence of some third-party oversight and in the absence of a larger community within which to have these discussions. And I think each of these approaches is limited. So the rules-based approach is limited because the rules that we follow are actually very, very slow to change and were written largely in a different era. So IRBs are not necessarily in the best position to make judgments about computational social science research. Another problem with the rules-based approach is that it makes it very hard to explain your reasoning to other people. So let's imagine you do a study and someone 
questions one of the decisions that you, ethical decisions of your research, it's not a very convincing explanation to say, I did this because it's allowed by the rules. It's much better if you have a reason or a basis for that decision that you can explain. So rules-based approaches can struggle. Ad hoc approaches can also struggle. Um, one reason is they're very difficult. So to think about all of these issues carefully and reason about them successfully is incredibly, incredibly difficult and time consuming. And you don't want to be doing all of your ethical reasoning on your own. And it also prevents community standards from emerging. And so in, in chapter six of Bit by Bit, I advocate for what I call a principles-based approach, which is that we follow certain ethical principles. And the good news is that we don't have to make up those principles ourselves. Those have already been developed by the research ethics community. And so we can draw on the wisdom of those uh, prior researchers to help inform our thinking uh, going forward. So in order to discuss these ethical principles and the kinds of research ethics challenge that arise, I wanna start by talking about three real computational social science studies um, that have been the subject of ethical commentary. So I picked these three studies uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I think they're all interesting research. Uh, the second is I think they are all complex ethically. So I don't think it'd be very interesting if I picked three studies that were ethically horrible because that doesn't leave a lot of room for thought and debate and discussion. So I think all of these studies are open to ethical interpretation in a way that I think is fruitful for our learning. And uh, the third reason I picked these examples is that they together they illustrate many of the tensions and challenges that that um, computational social scientists will face. So the first study I want to talk about is uh, commonly referred to as emotional contagion. Uh, it's this paper, um, Experimental Evidence of Massive Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks. So in this paper, researchers, some of whom were at Cornell and some of whom were at Facebook, uh, conducted an experiment on Facebook on the news feeds of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. So in some conditions, uh, participants had po uh, posts with positive words were more likely to get knocked out of their feed. And in other conditions, uh, participants who had um, posts that had more negative words were more likely to get knocked out of their feed. And then the researchers were subsequently studying um, what kinds of posts people would make. So were people who had positive posts with positive words blocked out of their feed, were those people more likely to make positive posts themselves or less likely to make negative posts? So this particular study, um, it happened without informed consent, beyond the informed consent that takes place in the Facebook Terms of Service. Uh, it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And then immediately it generated a large uh, outcry and debate. And um, subsequently, the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences published uh, a note uh, discussing some of the ethical issues with this study. It's also been debated subsequently in, in many papers. So that's one study. I want to tell you about a different study now. Um, so this study was called Taste, Ties, and Time. This was a study conducted by researchers at a university, and those researchers and some students from that university scraped the profiles from Facebook for the, a, a specific class of students at that university. Um, then they combined the data from Facebook with data from the university about things like um, what classes the students had taken, where they lived on campus, merged these two things together, and then used that data set to conduct research about topics related to, for example, social networks, how they evolve, the relationship between social networks and behavior. Then the researchers took steps to anonymize the data and then make it available to other researchers. So this here uh, is a paper um, describing the data set. Um, this project was done um, 
under the review of the IRB with the approval of the IRB at this university and it also had the approval of Facebook. Uh, however, once the data was made available online, um, researcher, other researchers figured out that despite the, tep the steps that the original researchers had taken to anonymize the data, it was possible to identify the university and possible to identify some of the students in the data set. The data set was taken down and is now not available for use in research. So this study is different in that um, it doesn't involve an experiment. It involves actually just observing people's behavior. Uh, the third study I want to talk about is called Encore. So this one was conducted by some computer scientists and what they were trying to do was to try to get measurements of the amount of web censorship that exists around the world. So in some parts of the world, certain websites are blocked by governments. And it's not clear which websites are, are blocked from which countries. And so how would you try to get a global measurement of web censorship? So what these researchers did is they created a snippet of code that someone could install inside of a web page. And then let's, for example, let's imagine I put this snippet of code in my homepage. Then if you visited my homepage, this snippet of code triggers a request to these researchers' servers, which then uh, triggers your browser to visit one of these potentially blocked sites. So it could be, for example, the website of a um, banned religious organization. Then they keep track of whether they are able to receive the answer from that website, and then that information goes back to the original researchers. So from the perspective of you as a user, your computer has now visited a potentially blocked website without your uh, consent and without your awareness. So these researchers actually consulted with their institutional review board as well before launching the study. And that institutional review board said that this was actually not considered human subjects research under the definition of things that IRBs usually follow. So this particular paper was published in a computer science conference, but it was also published with a signing statement, uh, ethical statement at the top of the paper, um, raising some issues with the uh, decisions that were made in the paper. And so these are kind of three different examples that we've seen. So uh, emotional contagion, taste, dies, and time, Encore, all different um, ethical issues, but all real studies that were motivated by real research questions that led to debate. And so what's the challenge, what's the problem here? Why are we having these researchers who are well-meaning and well-intentioned, why are we running into problems? And stepping back from these three studies, I think there's a more general problem going on. And part of the problem is that we have increased power. And so what do I mean by power? So as researchers, we now have the ability to observe the behavior of millions of people without their consent and without their awareness. Also, as researchers, we now have the capability to enroll millions of people in experiments, again, without their consent and without their awareness. And this kind of power is actually really new. Like social science researchers in the past have not had these capabilities. And now we really do have these capabilities. So we have these increased power. And yet at the same time, there's inconsistent and overlapping rules and norms and expectations about how this power should be used. It's ambiguous what we can and cannot do with this power. And this inconsistency comes from a variety of sources. I think three are most important. The first is that the rules are slow to change. So for example, the regulations that govern institutional review boards in the US, those recently underwent a modernization process and that took more than five years. And so what that means is it's gonna be very hard for the rules to continue to evolve as the technology continues to evolve. Second, there's little agreement about what are the key concepts that are often at stake. So privacy is a good example. So researchers, who entirely focus their research on defining and understanding privacy do not agree on how privacy should even be defined. And so 
if experts in a field cannot come to some consensus, then it's very unlikely that empirical researchers and uh, participants in studies will be able to come to a consensus as well. And the third reason for the inconsistency is that research is now happening in a blending of contexts. So let me explain what I mean there. So it used to be that the research context was relatively self-contained. So you would go into a psychology lab, do an experiment, and then leave the psychology lab. So when you're in that psychology lab, the rules of psychology labs apply. Increasingly, we're seeing experiments being done mixed into the normal everyday life of people. And so what rules then apply there? So a good example of this comes from emotional contagion. That experiment was done in the newsfeed of Facebook, and it was done by researchers, some of whom worked at Facebook and some of whom worked at Cornell. So in that blended context, which set of rules and norms should apply? Should it be the rules and norms of Cornell, Cornell's IRB? Should it be the norms and rules of oversight of experimentation on Facebook? What about the expectations that people have? Should they be the expectations that they have when they participate in a scientific research study? Or should it be the expectations they have when they go on Facebook and look at their newsfeed? So the blending of context makes it very difficult to uh, establish clear norms and expectations. And so what we have is increasing power, inconsistent ideas about how that power should be exercised, and this creates a problem. And this is what I think a lot of researchers face. They have to figure out how to deal with this set of uh, issues. And so what uh, I'm gonna argue for is a way of thinking about this that I hope will be useful to you. And the idea is that rather than thinking about the rules, which I said is where I think many social scientists start, I think we're better off abstracting a bit to the principles that were used to derive those rules. And these principles are less specific than the rules. And that's a good thing because it helps us then reason about situations for which they didn't exist, uh, with which the rules haven't yet been created. And these principles themselves actually can be def derived from some ethical framework. So I think moving away from the rules more towards principles and ethical frameworks will help us reason about a much wider range of situations and will also help us communicate our reasoning with others. Okay, so the good news is that we don't have to make up these principles. We don't have to make up these uh, ethical frameworks. This work has already been done for us. And so I'm gonna advocate for following a set of four ethical principles, uh, three of which were derived, were written down in the Belmont Report, which was a, a landmark report about research ethics um, in the US in the 1970s. This is the report that eventually led to the common rule and the IRBs as we know them today. Um, and then, so that, uh, the Belmont Report laid out three principles that are, I think, well known to social scientists. Uh, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. So those are the three principles in the Belmont Report. Then there's a fourth principle that I'm gonna advocate for, which comes from a different report called the Menlo Report. So this was commissioned by also the US government and it was um, commissioned in part because of ethical uh, uncertainty and ethical problems in research done by computer scientists. And so they said, let's come up with a report to help guide uh, ethics of research focusing on um, information technology. And so the Menlo Report authors reaffirmed the three Belmont principles and then added a fourth principle, respect for law and public interest. And so now what I'm gonna do is talk about each of those four principles, a little bit about it and how it can help you uh, guide your research. So the first principle I wanna talk about is respect for persons. And so generally what this means is that participants decide, not you. So this is, the key idea is you wanna respect the autonomy of your participants meaning giving them the power to decide whether to participate or not. And then this is often converted into the idea that we know of as informed consent. So informed consent is a way of operationalizing the idea of respect for persons. The second principle is beneficence. And so beneficence is about minimizing risks of studies, maximizing the benefits, and then deciding whether the study should go forward. So minimizing the risks 
Have you done everything you can to minimize the risks to your participants? Maximizing the benefits, again, have you done everything you can to maximize the benefits? And so these two things are often uh, require technical expertise and often researchers are in the best position to know about them. Uh, for a given study, are there small changes you can make that would uh, alter the balance here? And then once you've done all that technical work of minimizing the risks and maximizing the benefits, there's a second thing. And that second thing is deciding whether the study should still go forward. And so in my experience, actually technical expertise is sometimes not very helpful in this second step. So in uh, IRBs in the United States, they all are required to have people who are non-researchers serve on them. I've served on the IRB at Princeton University. We had non-researchers on the IRB. For example, we had a minister. And I found it very interesting that the minister would often ask different questions and bring a different point of view to the study. And so I think it's especially important. This also brings up an important dimension of research ethics, which is the idea of third party oversight. And so here the question is, who should be in a position to make these decisions? So should it be the researcher or should it be some third party, someone other than the researcher? And a very important reason um, that third party oversight can be helpful is that researchers are often the worst people to assess whether the risks and benefits are in balance. So most researchers, most research only happens if you believe it is incredibly important. Like research involves a lot of self delusion to thinking that what you're doing is so, so important. And, and that's true for my research too. Like we have to believe that what we're doing is incredibly important. And so if you are in a position where you believe what you're doing is incredibly important, that raises questions about whether you're the, in the best position to decide whether the risks and benefits of the study are in appropriate balance. So that's beneficence. <clears throat> the third principle um, from the Belmont report is justice. So justice is about the distribution of burdens and benefits of research. And so uh, it used to be the case that a lot of medical research involved poor people and a lot of the benefits of that medical research flowed to rich people. And so that somehow seems out of balance. Like what we would like is that the benefits and burdens of research are distributed in a way that's fair. And I think here it's particularly important to note that many of the research ethics failures of scientists have happened with very disadvantaged populations. So poorly educated and disenfranchised citizens, prisoners, institutionalized and mentally disabled children, old and debilitated hospital patients. The list of research ethics failures that, that scientists have done, it seems to almost always involve these very disadvantaged populations. I think that is something that we have to keep in mind whenever we're doing our work. If we are working with one of these disadvantaged populations, we have to ask ourselves, is this consistent with the principles of justice? <clears throat> now, there's a debate within the justice literature also about overly protective view of research ethics. And so it's also the case that sometimes populations at high risk also need access to the benefits of research. So for example, there was a time where a lot of medical research screened out pregnant women. And the idea was that this would be uh, trying to minimize the risk, but then they realized that pregnant women um, were then shut out of a lot of the benefits of research that could be helpful to pregnant women. Similar to children, often we don't want to include children in research studies, but also children need the benefits that can come from scientific research happening with their particular population. So within justice, it's not just about protection, it's also about access. And getting the balance between protection and access can be tricky. So let's take an example with Encore. So the people who are potentially put most at risk during Encore are people who are living in societies with repressive governments. And so you might imagine that when designing the study, we should try to prevent people from those countries from participating. On the other hand, those are the societies where potentially these measurements of internet censorship are most important and most valuable. And so here we see a real tension between the desire to protect people from the risks of research, 
with ensuring that they have access to the benefits of the knowledge that comes from that research. So the fourth principle, which comes uh, from the Menlo report, is respect for law and public interest. And so what this means is they interpret it to mean two different things. One is compliance, so this means follow the laws. And then the second is transparency-based accountability. And this generally means be open and honest about what you're doing. So we can think of both of these uh, in the context of emotional contagion. So compliance means follow the laws. So there are questions about um, whether Facebook's terms of service covers research like the research that happened. Uh, there are also questions about whether, in terms of compliance, whether um, all research should be governed by the common rule or not. There was a debate about whether there's a law in the state of Maryland that meant all research, even if it wasn't funded by the federal government, should be should be governed by the common rule. Then there are other people who say that law in the state of Maryland is actually not constitutional. And so compliance actually is quite difficult uh, for researchers because it's often very tricky to follow all of the laws, especially for research that's at a global scale. So Encore, for example, involved participants from I think more than 150 countries. So it'd be virtually impossible for a researcher to ensure that they, what they're doing is in compliance with the laws of all of those countries. The second part of respect for law and public interest is transparency-based accountability. And so here the idea is that basically you should not be doing stuff in secret. You should try to make what you're doing open and available to people and subject yourself to oversight that comes from that. So here, I think emotional contagion is actually a very positive example. So they published their work in a journal, they made it available open access, and that meant that everyone in the world had access to see what they had done, which allowed for a certain amount of accountability. Now, if Facebook had done that study and not published it, we would have less insight into what they are doing, and so there's less uh, oversight and accountability of what's happening. So those are the two ways that people think about respect for law and public interest. So overall, these are the four principles that I uh, have described respect for persons, beneficence, justice, respect for law and public interest, then a very important question is how do we balance these four principles? Because often they come into co conflict. And the answer is that it's very difficult. So there, the first thing to keep in mind though is that no one principle dominates the other principles. So often uh, informed consent is treated as if it is um, like one one thing above all other things. And that's not really right. We have to realize that all of these principles involve trade-offs and different designs are better or worse at different dimensions. So one way that I like to think about it is, um, and, that, and that how do you strike the right balance between these principles varies from case to case. So let's take um, taste, ties, and time. So in that study, uh, you could argue that by making the data available to other researchers, they were improving the benefits that came from that study. On the other hand, they were also increasing the risks to participants. And so there you have attention. How do you manage that attention? That involves trade-offs. And so there is no simple formula for how to balance these principles. It's something that has to be done in a case-by-case -case basis. And often you'll see sometimes there's something that would improve you along one dimension that would cause a, a trade-off along another dimension. So when making these trade-offs and balancing between these principles, I think there are two ethical frameworks that help us understand these principles a little bit better and reason about the trade-offs. And these two uh, ethical frameworks are consequentialism and deontology. So consequentialism, most associated with philosophers like John Stuart Mill, and this generally focuses on the end. So we say we should take an action if it leads to better ends in the world. A different school of ethical thought called deontology is associated with philosophers like Immanuel Kant, and there they generally focus on the means. So we should take actions that have good means independent of the ends that they lead to. And so these two ethical frameworks are themselves kind of in conflict. One focuses on means, one focuses on ends. Um, 
And I think there are a few things to keep in mind about both of these frameworks. First is that both of these approaches can be taken to extremes. So a pure extreme form of consequentialism um, can require us to, let's say, take me, I have a bunch of healthy organs, so I should go to the hospital and then a doctor should cut me up and take all of my organs and transplant them into other people. And so by taking me and cutting me up, we might be able to save six patients. And so a strong consequentialist would argue, extreme consequentialist would argue that we have an ethical obligation to cut me up for my organs. So that doesn't seem right that we have this obligation to cut people up and transplant their organs away. Likewise, a very extreme form of deontology also leads to kind of perverse decisions. So imagine that uh, I had planted a bomb on campus and I knew where this bomb was and if, if I didn't reveal its location, hundreds of people would die. So the extreme deontologist would argue that, that we should not even lie in the process of trying to learn about the location of this bomb. And that also seems a little bit um, like maybe not the wisest way of approaching this. And so both of these approaches can be taken to an extreme. And so if you find yourself having one of these approaches about a particular study, if you find yourself having a very consequentialist approach, if you find yourself having a very deontological approach, remember that taken to an extreme, that approach leads to perverse kinds of decisions. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that most of the ethical disagreements I've seen among computational social scientists are among people taking these different framework, different points of view. So for example, I've heard someone say, oh, look at all of the benefits that will come from this study. And then someone else says, no, but look, there was no informed consent from the participants. And then the original person says, yes, but look at all the benefits. And so here, what you have is you have one person who's arguing from a very consequentialist perspective focused on the benefits. You have one person who's focused on a very deontological perspective focused on the means, and they're just completely missing each other. And so if you find yourself in a discussion about the studies of a particular, uh, about the ethics of a particular piece of research, try to take a moment and see whether you're in a consequentialist frame or a deontological frame. And if you are, and the other person is in the other frame, try to switch for a second. Try to take a moment and put yourself into their frame and try to talk about it from within their frame. That's much more likely to reach consensus or at least much more likely to understand the nature of the disagreements. Okay, so in this video, I've talked about um, moving from a rules-based approach to following more of the principles that were used to derive those rules. And then when we have to find balance between these principles, moving to the ethical frameworks from which those principles were derived. Now, applying all of these ideas can be really tricky in practice. And so in part two, I'll discuss four areas of difficulty and I'll offer three practical suggestions. Thank you.